Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Waveform Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Marquez. And I'm Andrew. And today we've got David and Mel with us as well for another special deep dive episode. I'm going to say uh, keep your optimism hats on for this one, but also there's a lot of nerdy stuff and a lot of space talk. Take it away, David. All right. So you guys heard of the space race of the 1960s. Well, we're in 2021. And today on the show, we've got a new space race for you. A space race that you haven't probably thought about before. Stick with us. NASA's space shuttle program was a shining new phase in America's journey to the stars. Kind of a curious mix of science, business, and self-aggrandizement for a very small billionaire class. In part because, as I said, this is the first time that we're going to see a launch from American soil in almost 10 years' time. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero ignition, liftoff. So I'm about to bring you guys into a deep rabbit hole of exploration, mind blowingness, and uh, space stuff. As we all, you know, we all like space stuff. I just want to say space is like probably my favorite category. I don't get to talk about. Yeah. Anytime we do space trivia, I'm all over it. Yeah. Anytime we get to talk about space in any way, all of my like fourth, fifth, sixth grade like reading way too much about space comes up. So I'm excited. This will be interesting because there's a lot of space trivia in this. Let's see it. All yeah. right. I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, first question I got for you guys. Uh, do you know what satellite internet is? Just on a basic level? Yeah. How does it work? Um, well, as far as I can tell, there's a bunch of satellites in space and there's a bunch of data centers on Earth. And when people request information from the internet, it pings one of the satellites that's sort of geolocked over them, right? And then it goes down to a data center, and then it goes up to the satellite, goes back to the person. Mm-hmm. It's something I'm ass- like that. Assuming similar to like satellite television, yeah, uh, data transfer through wireless waves pinging off of satellites. But right. that's like the total <clears throat> basis of my knowledge on that. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Well, so as of as of 2018, um, how many people would you say didn't have access to internet? in the US and globally. Didn't have access to the, and we're saying like access in their homes, right? Like uh, general yeah. access. Yeah, like it general doesn't count like, if you go to Starbucks or something like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Most yeah. people have, <laughs> yeah. yeah, most people have access to the internet. You said 2018. Yeah. I would, I would be estimating 90% of the US has access to the internet. I guess 80% has access. Okay. So as of 2018, about 14 million people in the US didn't have internet access at all. Okay. And 25 million people didn't have broadband access or faster. So that's, that's like like internet you need to do video calls, you know, there's we've got a pandemic going on, the stuff you need to do school with, you know. Yeah. That's like a pretty sizable percentage. I mean, just cuz you have broadband internet doesn't mean it's great internet right. either. There's some there's really a difference bad between broadband like internet. having speed and consistency yeah, yeah, yeah. as well, right? It's about 4%. Yeah. Okay, cool. so that's just the US though. Yeah. Um Think about how much of the world is online. Yeah. So it's a much bigger difference around the world. There's lots of areas that are coming online now, yeah. which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, it's definitely probably like 60% of the world, 70% of the world has internet access. But it's it's not as good as certain individual countries. Right. Do you have a guess, Andrew? You know, I was very off for the US, so I feel like... Uh, 70, 75% has access okay. worldwide. Yeah, you guys, are, you guys are close. Mark okay. has got it perfectly right, actually, immediately. Uh, about 40% of the planet isn't online yet. Okay. That's a lot of people. Yeah. 40% of the entire planet, uh, more than 3 billion people still don't have access to the internet. 3 yeah. billion. It's a lot of people, right? Um, and at this point, like in 2021, the internet's like become this essential utility for everything that we do like you think about youtube you can learn anything you can learn any skill you don't really need to go to college anymore you can kind of learn whatever trade you want you Mm -hmm. know um and even if you go into a store and you want to apply for a job most of them will say like oh apply online apply online right you know it's it's ridiculous it's crazy i was thinking about sorry i'm interrupting but the beginning of this pandemic where i was like all right the whole world around us is changing but what if you just like emerged from your house with no internet how long would it take you to find other context clues to alert you about what's happening right and there was like oh, road signs yeah. that said like things about covid yeah. and there was like people started wearing masks more in the airport but right. you didn't, unless you looked it up mm-hmm. 
it would be hard to know. It's kind of like um, the, it reminds me of this story about War of the Worlds. There's this thing yeah. that happened in the New Jersey. System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells where they were playing the War of the Worlds radio show in New Jersey, but they had like a public service announcement that was going over, that was like taking over the broadcast. Mm -hmm. So it skipped the whole part of the public service announcement where it said, by the way, what you're about to hear is not real. Yeah. And they played the War of the Worlds and there was a total public freak out. Yeah, yeah. Everyone was, everyone actually thought aliens were invading. Yeah. So it's crazy. It's like everyone goes online now. They say like, oh my gosh, was that an earthquake? You know, every little thing, we instantly have access to this internet. So... Wouldn't you agree that satellite internet, the idea that these satellites can, you know, orbit the planet, they can kind of reach everywhere, right? There's 40% of the Earth that's not online. And because satellites can orbit the Earth, if you get enough of them, you can kind of get internet anywhere you are on the planet. Do you agree that that's a pretty good thing overall? Seems like a good idea. <laughs> the, the way you're asking also, it seems like seems I should like, like, yes. Seems like how a podcast would start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Am I baiting you? Let's see. I mean, yeah, in terms of infrastructure and everything, that obviously would make the most sense because yeah. you're not actually establishing an in-the-ground infrastructure yeah. in hard-to-reach places. Right. And the world's been changing. People are working from home. There's nomadic and cr creator economy lifestyles. And like, if people can kind of just have the internet, they can kind of work from anywhere. So it seems great. Um, have you heard of Starlink before? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that sort of floated around. I think yeah. I know a couple it people floated. on Twitter yeah, who have, who have Starlink internet. You want to give a quick explanation of what you believe it to be? Um, Starlink is an Elon Musk company, yep. and uh, they're putting a bunch of satellites in orbit and giving people Starlink internet, essentially. And I don't know if it's any better than regular internet other than just being accessible in more places. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's about all I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the... Older satellite internet. Satellite internet, surprisingly, has been around for a very long time. Yeah. I uh, showed you guys where I grew up yesterday, the middle of absolute nowhere, mm -hmm. Smartville, California. And we had what was called HughesNet at the time. And that was way back in like the early 2000s, right? HughesNet's been around since like 1996. Satellite internet's been like a, an idea for a while. Um, but those satellites, there were very few of them, and they were in what's called geosynchronous orbit, which means that as the Earth rotates the satellite is at a position uh, in orbit where it's rotating with the Earth, right. right? So, like, that's good and bad. It's good because as long as you have a clear view of the sky, you can consistently get internet, right? Mm -hmm. But when something is further away, there is this law called the inverse square law, and it kind of relates to both, like, light and data transmission and all that stuff. Basically, the further something is away to an nth degree weaker the signal is. So yeah. if you're in geosynchronous orbit, it's higher up in orbit, which means it stays with the Earth, but the speeds you're getting are not that great, right? You're like getting pretty slow, like it's not even DSL. Mm -hmm. um, and they have over the years, like companies like HughesNet have been able to like get faster speeds, but they're still not that fast. Like they're still slower than most data connections. So Starlink is kind of this uh, new company that like you said was launched by Elon Musk that is trying to make satellite internet much more readily available, and it's supposed to be much, much faster. Um, he wants it to be able to be like, you can game on it, which means like you they want latency that's like one MS, like 10 MS is like what they're aiming for right now mm -hmm. with the latency, and then they want gigabit internet off of satellite. I want gigabit internet. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah that, <clears throat> that's cool a lot. Because yeah, it's cool because you have a little dish, you can carry it around with you anywhere. You could just be in your, you know, camper van in the middle of the woods and you could get gigabit internet and it's kind of amazing, right? Like it sounds like a great promise. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. It's one of those things where like we have wired internet right now and everything you said doesn't happen. Like yeah. out of the best I've ever had is Fios, like eight or nine hundred down. But yeah. even like playing games like Valorant, pinging to an East Coast server around the East Coast, it's like twenty to thirty. Right. Yeah. At like one MS is in or it's t sounds 10, 10 impossible. 10 is what they're aiming Even for. Even 10 sounds is what they're aiming for. I don't think I've ever seen 10 MS ping yeah. on any game I've ever played in my life. Yeah, so so the project's actually been around for a while. I know you said you only kind of recently heard of it. It's yeah. only because it's starting to just recently start percolating and like get online. Mm -hmm. It actually was uh, announced in 2015. The project's been in development for quite a while. But they only got the first two beta-tested satellites up in 2018. Okay. So it hasn't really been in orbit for that long. Um, 
And after they tested those satellites, they actually got, they were able to move more satellites into even lower Earth orbit. And so something I should explain here is that the reason Starlink can be so fast is because they are in a part of orbit called low Earth orbit, which means they are much closer to Earth but because they're much closer to Earth, they move really fast. They're not uh, in the orbit where they're turning with the planet. They're, they're not rocketing in... across the sky. Right? Okay. So does that mean when you're on the ground, you're going to be switching between satellites yes. over and over again? Yeah. They okay. kind of create this big mesh network. Cool. And when mesh they launch... networks always work. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and when they launch them up there, they deploy like 60 at a time. And it's really interesting. You can kind of see these like these chains of Starlink satellites that are just going across the sky together. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and it's really interesting. But when you have satellites that are shooting across the sky that fast, you have to put a lot more of them up there because obviously, like you said, you're going to lose signal quickly. Mm -hmm. And like, yes, because of the inverse square law and because of in, uh, advancements in internet technology, we have like way faster internet from them now. But you're going to try to keep linking to new locations constantly this now. is reminding me very much of 5g mm -hmm. just millimeter wave every time you hear about these millimeter wave towers and you walk by one on the street and you get one millisecond ping and a gigabit down and then you keep walking and you've got to find the next one otherwise yeah. you're not connected to it, it is anymore. it is very similar to that idea right okay. yeah, yeah, yeah 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 oh wow so those are that is one constellation of starlink satellites it looks like have you ever played snake.io yeah. Yeah, 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 it looks like that. You can just see them like stars moving yeah, across the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this this kind of like gets into this whole thing, right? Wow. This is quite interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, for audio listeners, it was basically just, it looks like if just Orion's belt was even closer together times 20 mm -hmm. and just like moving across the sky. Yeah. That's fascinating. So those were the first 60 that got deployed in May 2019. Okay. Okay, so like they, they send up this pod and then as they get into orbit, they just start deploying like doom, 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 mm. doom. And all of a sudden you've got this constellation mm -hmm. and they're all kind of linked together in this mesh network shooting down internet. Game time. How many satellites would you guys say were in space right now? How many satellites are in space? Yeah. Like wow. space our orbit or just space in general? Space. Most of them are in Earth's all orbit. Space. There's a lot of dead satellites oh, that are just yeah. like yeah, just falling out of orbit or just kind of. You do know a lot of fun facts about space. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I was guessing how many there are, are sheesh. we assuming we're the only intelligent life? Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think yes. that's fair. Because it's not infinite. okay in Earth orbit. <laughs> in Currently Earth's in Earth, Earth orbit. launched from or Earth. <laughs> yes, everything launches from Earth. Yes, I what think. Is that? Launch from Mars. I love I all the follow. Know. I'm saying, you know, I think there's probably um, <clears throat> 400 satellites, 400 in, in Earth's orbit. Okay, yeah. any guess I make is just completely blind. <laughs> I'll, I'll guess 401. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many would you say have ever been launched in history altogether? Satellites. Oh. I guess I just assumed when they break, they just stay out in space, and I was counting those. So that used to be how it worked. They can, okay, they like come back. They can down. eventually some, fall. Some can now fall. Yeah. Mm. Let's go with eight hundred ever. So four hundred now, eight hundred ever. Yeah. Okay. It's probably like a like a, one of these curves like this. Yeah. Like for the last hundred years, not very many. Then a couple <laughs> hundred years because we didn't launch very much. Yeah. And then, true. And then we just started getting all of them, and now half of them are out of orbit. Yeah. That's my guess. Okay. So. Uh, 12,020 have ever been launched. Wow. Okay. That's a lot more than 800. Yeah. And that okay. is, that is like, that has been bolstered very recently. I will say that. Mm -hmm. uh, 7,520 are still in space right now. Mm -hmm. I was closer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 7,000. Okay. And four, about 4,500 are active. So almost half of those that are in space are not doing anything right now. Right. Mm. Um, and those are all numbers from August 21. 2021, according to the European Space Agency, who kind of keeps data on this. So it's very, very, very active. Only a couple months prior when I was doing this uh, initially, it was only about 6,000 in space as of like the beginning of the year. <clears throat> so that's been a lot. And if you, especially when you consider that 12,000 have only been ever launched and in only a few months, yeah. one twelfth of that has been accelerated, right? Hmm. All Do right. you know where they're launching from? <clears throat> I think like Cape... Canaveral or, a or lot something US I, based or 
Um, yeah. I'm not entirely sure specifically where, but I know that they're usually around the equator. Okay. Uh, so wherever just, they do launch from, it's probably it around Florida, It just seems, because you Texas. said earlier 6,000, now there's seven, so that means a 1,000 of them have, oh, but it's yeah. like a pod since, thing, Since right? January, yeah. It's not like each individual launch. No, each individual launch is about 60 satellites okay, okay. that go up together. Cool. Wow. Um, That's still a lot of launches in a couple months. Okay, yeah. So, so Starlink, um, decent part of this. Uh, how many would you guys guess that Starlink is trying to launch right now as sort of part of their little network? Well, like a considering goal? Considering like, that they're going to, like they have authorization. I'm guessing they want to completely... Year or two, like two years, basically. They want to finish the job. They want to like f- cover the entire Earth and and have this whole thing available for everyone on Earth. I guess that's the goal, right? Yeah, because I mean, it's they have to have sort of this mesh network. They're moving really quickly, right? You know, Sheesh. what would your guess be? Maybe they want to double it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they want seven thousand more satellites. I was going to go like, like cover 10, the Earth. 000, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot. Forty-two thousand yeah. satellites. They're, whoa. Okay, that that's a lot ha- of satellites. That they have authorization to uh-huh. launch. Not only that they want to, but they already have yeah. authorization Sheesh. from the FCC. Hmm. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot. That it's just, a lot of- I'm still, my eye keeps thinking about that clip you just showed us of yeah. like watching yeah. 60 in a row pass by you mm. in the night sky mm. with your naked eye. I'm just mm. imagining the sky like looking like it's moving mm. all the time and then getting like motion sickness, oh, God. like <laughs> looking up stars in the air. like yeah. in an array yeah. like rotating rolling. around yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's a little different, right? Like stars um, that we see in the night sky, they they don't really, they, they're moving, but not really. Yeah, we're, we're kind we of moving around them. It's a it. different yeah, way. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so yeah. So the reason that we found this topic at all, title card, um, <laughs> is that uh, Adam actually sent me this article called SpaceX Dark Satellites Are st- Still Too Bright for Astronomers. Um, it was in Scientific American. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, the article basically says that, yeah, Starlink is very cool. You know, it's a great idea. Um, but it's be creating a lot of issues for astronomers. They are reflecting light off of from like the sun and it's kind of messing up things in astronomy a lot of different types of astronomy interesting yeah so there's telescopes on earth that are trying to look at things far far away Mm -hmm. and these these satellites are flying in between the telescope and the thing they're looking at and reflecting light back into them that they don't need in their data right so if you're generally Mm -hmm. if you're doing like a long exposure photo for Mm -hmm. example like all astronomers do super long exposures they do up to like two days right of exposures And with the geosynchronous orbit satellites, they know exactly where they are at all times. They can just point the satellite in a different direction. They're able to do it. They can avoid it. And there's not that many, right? Because you don't need to have that many if they're in geosynchronous orbit because you always have a connection. With these, they're just flying through. And you don't really know where the path of them is and when you can avoid them. And, And the fact that, like, you know, right now there have only been a couple thousand that have been launched. And that's already creating a problem. Yeah. What happens when there are 42,000? Um, so at first, these Starlink satellites were like really, really bright, right? They were they were reflecting light from the sun. And basically, astronomers would like, you know, they'd point their satellites at them and they'd be like, oh, a star. And then they'd look, they'd point their oh, telescope, telescope at them. Telescope, yeah. yeah. And they'd be like, oh, look, a star. And then they would see, oh, that's... Oh, that's a satellite. That's right. actually a satellite, not a star. Moving too fast. Yeah, so it, both of it was moving too fast, and then it was like, it's just too freaking bright. Mm-hmm. And um, there's all these different issues that it was creating because these were reflecting so much light that it could actually damage the telescope, oh. right? Because their sensors are that's... really, really sensitive, mm-hmm. and light from stars are so far away. And because of that inverse square law, the right. light from a star is like, you're getting way less light than it's actually emitting, whereas the satellite reflecting all that sunlight beaming it's like when you take a um, magnifying, magnifying glass, glass yeah, on an yeah. ant right mm-hmm. you're kind of burning the sensor and you can actually break the sensor because they're so bright uh so that was kind of a major issue and like credit to starlink um they don't want to necessarily just dist- they want to work with the astronomers right mm-hmm. um it's kind of this like 50 50 word thing where like yeah we're gonna do this uh we got authorization and we're just gonna do it we'll try to mitigate the problems that we create but we're still gonna do it I have you know? a question yeah. about these astronomers. Are these amateur astronomers? Are these professional astronomers? Because when I think of astronomers, 
there's obviously telescopes on Earth, huge observatories that mm -hmm. have to look through the atmosphere, but mm -hmm. there's also telescopes in orbit mm -hmm. that I assume are above a lot of these satellites, mm -hmm. and they do that for an unobstructed view yeah. of the atmosphere. Yeah. How much of these astronomers complaining are professional astronomers versus hobbyists in the backyard? Yeah. Is it both? So a lot of professional astronomers. Okay. I'm going um, to guess just because it's cameras and long exposure that kind of when i was first thinking of this i was thinking of like oh someone looking with their eye through a telescope and it like <laughs> no. reflecting light but if no. it sounds like if it's destroying long exposure mm -hmm. like astrophotography not even astrophotography like yeah it's like astronomers deep taking space stuff. Yeah, yeah 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 no it's it's both um okay. basically they do eventually a lot of these astronomers that i talked to did say that they eventually are going to probably need to put satellites into space but right now, uh, one of the ones that they've been working on for the last, basically since like 2008, it's called the LSST. It's in Chile. And uh, it's pretty much the biggest uh, telescope that has ever been created. It has the biggest sensor that has ever been made. It's like multiple gigapixels. Uh, and it takes like up to two minute or two day photos, basically. I love these things. And the, the point of this is to like explore things like dark matter and just like, different universes and galaxies and just things that we've never seen before. And then I think we're going to borrow it for a little bit and shoot a <laughs> smartphone review with it. I mm -hmm. think that's the plan too. Yeah. Like yeah. Turn around, point it back <laughs> at <laughs> us. That'll be fun too. Yeah, that'd be cool. Sometime. You yeah. can see us. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. And they basically said to put a telescope like this into space, they're just way too big, way too heavy. Mm -hmm. It's right now, it's just too much to get that into orbit. They're so massive. These are huge telescopes. Um. So yeah, so like Starlink was, you know, they, they were still trying to work with astronomers because they they understood that like, yeah, this is kind of a problem. We're still going to do it, but it's kind of a problem. So they worked with astronomers to create these conferences uh, called SATCON. There's SATCON 1, SATCON 2 that have happened so far. Uh, after SATCON 1, they basically were like, okay, the biggest issue right now is that these are reflecting too much light and there is different degrees of brightness where it becomes not as much of an issue for the astronomers. Mm -hmm. So they tried different things. They painted the satellites black. They nice. Paint, right? Okay. So, cool. Matt black satellites. Yeah. I'm on board. <laughs> yeah. Just keep going. So they're darker. They're darker. So they're not reflecting as much light. Uh -huh. uh, Starlink sends those up. They start burning up and uh, heating up like a crap load because yeah. the temperature difference um, when the Earth is facing the sun versus when it's not facing the sun. Very big difference. It gets really hot and really cold in space. Yeah. Yeah. So that that became an issue. It was overheating all the Starlink satellites. Okay. Um, now they actually do something called VisorSat, uh, which is actually putting little, basically putting sunglasses on the satellites. Cool. Yeah. You know. Huh. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> which kind of like it darkens it for the astronomers. And then one other thing that they do is um, during the periods of time when the astronomers need to be seeing into space, the satellites will rotate their solar cells to be a uh, knife's edge okay. versus the Earth. That's cool. So now instead of blocking this amount, you're only blocking like this amount, right? Does that affect that the internet that they're no. sending? Okay. That's mostly, that's just for power, okay. right? So it's collecting power while the astronomers sort of don't need to use it. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but we found this article really intriguing because it was like it seemed like there could be a lot more to this. It was also written a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really wanted to like catch up with the update, right? Because things like the LSST, the new telescope in Chile, it was actually supposed to go into service like end of this year or next year, which is crazy because it's being been being worked on since 2008. Imagine you get all of this funding, it's the biggest astronomical project of all time, and all of a sudden, the entire atmosphere just becomes littered yeah. in orbit with all these satellites. Wow. It's crazy, right? It's funny that, like, I'm picturing, uh, if you zoom way out from Earth, it's like, oh, Earth, these Earthlings want to connect with, like, other, like, maybe intelligent civilizations, but they've surrounded their own planet with too much space junk to actually yeah. communicate <laughs> or, like, see anything, and that's kind of a... Bleak, and that yeah. is a, that is a concern that we'll get into later. Oh, um, no. Adam, uh, so we called up Emily, who is the person that Emily Zhang. She's the person that wrote this article for Scientific American. I'm Emily Zhang. I recently graduated from Columbia University. Um, I did some freelance science journalism, which is how this article came about, um, and I currently work for the Veritasium YouTube channel. Um, so this article 
I majored in astrophysics, so my background is in astronomy. And naturally, one of the biggest conflicts or concerns in the astronomical community at the time that I wrote the article, and I would say today, is satellite constellations. So she was an astrophysicist, and now she works for Veritas, which That's is kind amazing. of amazing. Kind that of shows amazing, that, like, yeah. you can go to school for anything and still be a YouTuber. <laughs> the internet. At the end of the day. The internet. Um, yeah. So the biggest thing that she wanted to really highlight to us when we called her was that this is kind of happening with astronomers not really being able to do anything about it, right? It's kind of just like, there's no laws really about space. We just, I think the main sentiment would be powerlessness because I think these astronomers, they're not saying like down with, with SpaceX and Starlink and Blue Origin and, and Project Kuiper and all of these forever. Um, I think we understand that, you know, there are multiple parties involved and we're going to have to compromise. But the main thing is that I think we just, astronomers haven't really been able to do anything at all. Um, and so having to sit on the sidelines while what you study and what your expertise is in is, is being dominated by these other forces that are very new to the game is, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's difficult to, to just have to be a bystander to that. I would say it's, it's pretty concerning that internationally and, and even nationally, we're not seeing much discussion uh, about regulation, about laws around this. There's this space treaty that was written during uh, the space race, but it was very vague. It was specifically written between nation states, so not about individual co corporations and companies. And really the main thing that it wanted to highlight was not being able to use space for like war purposes. Like there were still r ways, there's loopholes that were written in so that you probably could use it for war purposes. But the idea was like, you can't, you can't mount a rocket launcher on the moon. You can't like <laughs> make a giant space laser that is mounted somewhere. But again, this, this space treaty was written literally in the 60s during the original space race. Mm -hmm. uh, the world has changed a lot since then, clearly. A little. And I don't think it took into account the fact that now, instead of there being a space race between individual countries, it is now billionaire corporations, right? There's like, even recently in the news, it's been the billionaire space race. Yep. What's being called the dawn of a new space age. Billionaire Richard Branson, now the Tomorrow, first another billionaire is paying his way into space. 71-year-old Branson beating Amazon founder Jeff Bezos to space by just nine days. You've got Jeff Bezos versus Elon Musk versus uh, the Virgin Galactic guy. Um, yeah, I don't know. Richard Branson. Richard Branson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and all these people are just like sending themselves into space. They're sending other people into space. And it's kind of just a flex. Um, but the fact that it is now individuals kind of makes this a lot more complicated because at least the UN can kind of like make these treaties and talk about who can do what. But the nature of capitalism is to produce more and better than your competition. And when you have these companies like Amazon slash Blue Origin, you've got SpaceX, you've got Facebook that are all wanting to get on top of each other and just beat each other out, <clears throat> then then what do you do? Um, so anyway, but what Emily was kind of trying to say was that like this is all happening, right? This is all exponentially growing and these astronomers don't really have a big say in it. Yeah, it makes me think about like how how far above a country is still the country? I'm sure there's some rule about this. There's no like, rule about this. Because obviously if you fly over <laughs> another country, oh, you mean like airspace, a certain airspace? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, a, yeah. that's one thing. Yeah, but if you're at 40,000 feet or if you're at 100,000 feet, like where does that yeah. end? And orbit then suddenly you're in high Earth orbit. officially space, so it's like there's not really a... And then the other thing is like the satellites are just like streaking, right? They're going so fast that it's like they're in one country and another country and another country. The issue is, is we've got a similar situation again like we have with um, certain types of social media and so on and so forth where technology is advancing faster than regulations can keep up. That was Jeremy. He's an astrophysicist we talked to in Chile. Sort of like Facebook and Twitter and all these things, we're just now trying to figure out how do you regulate social media? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And holy crap, we're way past the point where we should have yeah. regulated this. Yeah, exactly. You know? Um, and so that's the thing about space right now is like, and so that got in my head, like, how, how do you regulate this? Because again, like you said, that's, it's something that's way up in orbit. It's not yeah. in a country. And then the other thing is there's not a lot of incentive for individual governments to necessarily regulate it. Because yeah, like who regulates it? Right. 
and and also your like your country's GDP mm-hmm. is determined by how much output it makes. And so if there are more companies in your country that want to create like get into this newfound frontier that makes a lot of money, you don't really have any incentive to say no. So we want to learn a little bit more about how this is going to go, what the astronomers and astrophysicists think about this, how they feel about it, specifically what they said about like moving at the pace of social media, how we could possibly regulate it, who is going to regulate mm-hmm. it. You know, this is like seems like un- untouched territory, like nobody knows what to do. Um, are, we, are we all on the same page that it should be regulated? Like the obvious path is that they're about to put 40,000 new satellites into orbit and it's going to really suck for astronomers on Earth, which is most astronomers. Yeah. I Something mean, should be it, done or they're just going to do it. It'll yeah, suck for everyone it. on Earth if we don't regulate right. it at some point. And actually, there was this uh, tweet that I saw that said once SpaceX gets 12,000 of the 42,000 up, and originally they had only asked for 12,000 mm-hmm. and it got accepted. Mm-hmm. And then it got accepted so easily that very soon after they were like, can we put 30,000 more? And the FCC was like, sure. Huh. And it was like, what? <laughs> they didn't really have any reason to say no. Yeah. I guess they didn't yeah. think of any. But is it going to be bad for us on Earth because now the night sky looks different? Or will we will we Mul- even be able to see that? Multiple things. There was a tweet that I saw that, uh, that basically said once the 12,000 are up, the number of satellites that we will be able to see will outnumber the amount of stars we will be able to see. So the night sky will, will th- we kind of think they're just depending on where stars, you are but they are satellites. Hmm. And to be fair, the way that they are visor satting these and all these things, uh, a lot of the times it, it can make it so it's hard to see with your naked eye, especially during the day. Mm, Um, You'll most easily be able to see them at dawn and dusk. And the fear is that the worst affected science is actually some of the most important. That was Jonathan McDowell, an astrophysicist at Harvard. uh, It's the uh, science where you're doing wide area surveys, looking at a lot of sky, low near the horizon, uh, early in the evening at twilight. Um, which is when the satellites are absolutely the worst. But that's where you have to look to find the asteroid that's going to hit the Earth. And so that, what we call planetary defense uh, subset of astronomy, is the one that's potentially most threatened. So we might lose that kind of uh, astronomy, which is not great. Yeah, so for context, there are about... The upper estimates are about 10,000 visible stars in the night sky right. at night, depending, huh. regardless of where you are on Earth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it'll outnumber it pretty easily. Wow. And, um, you know, a lot of these people said, like, you know, you won't be able to see them with your naked eye. But there's so many issues because not only uh, is it going to, you know, is it emitting all this stuff, but also even if you turn the wings so that they're knife's edge towards the Earth, the core part of the satellite is still blocking a light signal from coming through of a potential, you know, a potential star that you're trying mm-hmm. to observe, right? Mm-hmm. You're trying to observe the star and you can just get these huge streaks that just fly through your image when you're using, when you're doing long exposure stuff, right? Yeah. So this is when a single satellite flies through Hubble's field of view. Wow. It's just a yeah. big slash straight through your image. Yep. You know, you're getting this deep space image. Honestly, that'd probably make for a really good YouTube intro sequence. (laughs) Hey, what's up? I'm KBHD here. Bright white streak through the sky. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's crazy because there's so many random elements of it that you can tell are natural. And then there's just this perfectly straight line, like like straight through the middle. Yeah. Beautiful stars and then just straight line. And just like, imagine that's like one telescope or something. Oh and my gosh. One That's one satellite. Yeah. Imagine what happens when you've got potentially hundreds or thousands yeah. that are coming through. And that's here. interesting because Hubble is one of the atmospheric yeah. telescopes. It's already orbiting Earth. But it's lower orbit than a lot of these low orbit oh, Earth satellites. Oh, wow. Which so is this crazy. is even messing with those yeah, Even if you put okay. uh, these telescopes into space, then you could still have satellites coming through, okay. which is wild. That's brutal. It's just wild. Wow. Yeah. Um, I love Hubble. I know. Hubble's so dope. And they're actually going to replace Hubble pretty soon, right. um, which is cool as well. Uh, but yeah, so she we want to learn more about this. Uh, so she had us call up these two people, this one guy named Jeremy Treglone reed who is an astronomer in Chile and an astrophysicist named Jonathan McDowell uh, at Harvard. So we first called up Jeremy 
in Chile. Um, and surprise, surprise, our call had a lot of issues, a lot of problems. His internet was not great. Uh, and we actually had to call him a second time a couple weeks later because we tried to salvage the call we had. But even during the call, it was like I heard every fifth word that he said. And mm. I tried to make sense of what he was saying. And it just like didn't work well. And then the service that we use that does the podcasting interviews just couldn't upload his side. We only got 15 minutes of raw data and it was just not good. Sounds like we need Starlink. Yeah. So that was that's <laughs> that's the, the funny thing is he was like, this is really affecting my work. But I could really use one of these Starlinks right now. <laughs> yeah, wow. It was just, it was, it was so ironic. Huh. Um, we asked him about the LSST telescope, and he just said, like, you know, yes, I see it as things stand at this precise moment in time. Yes, I do see it as being a, um, a major development issue. This could be such a major issue because they've been working on it since like 2008 and then all of a sudden there's going to be thousands just flying through. And the LS the LSST works on more than just optical stuff. It also does radio um, telescope work, radio astronomy, which Starlink specifically is another problem for because not only are you blocking uh, the light that's coming, if you're doing radio astronomy and you're listening, they're listening for literally black holes, right? They're listening for energy coming out of black holes, which is wild. And there's just these faint whispers from, you know, wherever the heck. And they're in Chile and there's no signal coming through. They're literally listening for black holes. Yeah. And then you think about, okay, there's this satellite that's whizzing by. Not only is it brighter than it should be and it's blocking potential signals from coming through, it's also shooting down gigabit internet yeah. <laughs> which is a radio just signal puking in it all it over the telescope and and he was telling me that these that whiz by they could literally just make the your entire image just white and radio astronomy is a lot more sensitive some of these objects are thousands of times brighter than the sun is to these radio telescopes and that can cause burnouts with equipment and you know damaged equipment which that costs money to replace and loss of you know observing time because you're having to wait for the equipment to be replaced some of the space telescopes, we take a two-day exposure. Uh, and so because we're looking for ludicrously faint things, right? And so, you know, go, oh, here's a here's a light ray from that star. Here's another light ray from that star, right? And, and so it doesn't take... So when you have a bloody bright satellite going overhead, it leaves a really bright trail on your image that saturates the detector that's trying to look for so much fainter stuff. They could literally just make the your entire image just white. Yeah. Like it can completely Jeez. ruin the image and it could also be one of the things that breaks the telescope. And this telescope, there's been millions and millions of dollars invested into this telescope. And so the fact that they've been working on this basically since 2008, it's supposed to be operational by 2023. It was supposed to be 2022, but then COVID. Mm -hmm. And then out of nowhere, like a couple years before you open, all of a sudden the orbit just starts being filled. It's kind of ridiculous. Like yeah. it's not really fair, right? It's like building like a beachfront property and then they, by the time you're done, they build another property right in front yeah. of the ocean or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, just pretty lose much. The view. Yeah. Pretty much. You spend 10 years building it and then all of a sudden the condo goes up right yeah. in front of you or something. Yeah. This episode of Waveform is brought to you by Canva. Sometimes working with friends can be a pain, kind of like those group projects in school where only one person does the work, but everyone's supposed to get credit. Well, Canva makes working with friends not only easy, but fun as well. So Canva Pro is a design platform that empowers users to create and share exceptional content. It was so good that it was named the most promising private company by Enterprise Tech 30 back in 2019. But designing with Canva Pro is simple and efficient because anyone on your team can access over 100 million premium stock photos, videos, audio and graphics to be used anywhere and everywhere. You and your closest four friends can sign up now and unlock everything Canva Pro has to offer for just $12.99 per month. Would, would you consider me one of your closest friends? Am I in the four? Yeah, one okay. of four, yeah, four, top oh, four. nice, Easy. only $12.99. Definitely. So make sure that Canva Pro is the first step in creating profitable lifetime partnerships with your team. Design like a pro with Canva Pro right now and you can get a free 45 day extended trial when you use my promo code. So just go to canva.me slash waveform to get your free 45 day extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash waveform. Canva.me slash waveform. This episode of Waveform is brought to you by Truebill. 
So as humans, we have our faults. You know, we make mistakes from leaving the Discord channel up after production to failing to reply to an important text message. But these are issues that are all free of charge. There are some mistakes, though, that are costing you hundreds of dollars that you might not even know about. So Truebill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. So the app allows users to see all their subscriptions in one place, keep the ones you want, and cancels the ones you don't. So stop wasting your money on free subscriptions that ended years ago, and Truebill's concierge is there to help you cancel any unwanted subs so you don't have to. So they make sure all the robots could do all that work. So Truebill's mission is for everyone to live their best financial lives, and there's just no way that can happen while sending money every month to unused products or things you don't use anymore. So join the over 2 million users on Truebill, including myself, and start saving your money today. Start canceling your unused subscriptions at truebill.com slash waveform. That's T-R-U-E-B-I-L-L dot com slash waveform. It could save you hundreds a year. All right, so we're back. Again, we got two independent recommendations for Jonathan McDowell, this astrophysicist at Harvard. And uh, he proceeded to sort of blow our minds about like how ridiculous this is all going. The, the bottom line is there's nowhere to hide from these satellites, right? It's also a problem for radio astronomy. Uh, uh, we're in the, we have these radio telescopes in very isolated regions where there's no radio transmissions in the vicinity, except if satellites coming overhead, <laughs> you know, lots of radio, tra very bright radio transmissions. And even if they're in a fairly narrow band, mostly if 1% leaks out into a slightly different frequency, we're trying to listen to these incredibly faint whispers from distant, you know, creating black holes and, and a tiny amount of bleed off from this super loud searchlight radio satellite uh, is just going to swamp us. What if orbit is just totally filled with signals from these satellites uh -huh. and we can't listen for these whispers anymore? We're basically creating this kind of like dome around the Earth where we can't listen outside of it, right? Yeah. We can't look for things outside of it. We can't listen for things outside of it. And he is convinced that there is going to be a catastrophic failure event before anything is actually done about this problem. Um, have you guys heard of uh, Kessler syndrome before? Kessler? Kessler syndrome. I have not heard of Can't that. Can't say I have. No? Okay. Uh, so in orbit, things are really just falling. They're in free fall, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I think a lot of people don't actually realize is that they're just far away from enough from the Earth so that they are falling towards the Earth, but they're also falling in a direction, in a vector away from the Earth. And they're at a such uh, direction that they're just kind of like spinning because it's just this combination of downward force and then outward force. And it mm -hmm. kind of creates this angled vector. So when things are in free fall, they can fall really fast, right? Uh, so Kessler syndrome is when you get something in orbit that hits another thing in orbit and then it creates shrapnel in orbit slash free oh, fall. Mm, and that is... creates more shrapnel and then that hits more stuff which creates more shrapnel. This reminds me of a scene in Interstellar. Yeah. I don't Gravit know if you've seen that movie. I, I watched it like two weekends ago. But actually. there is an explosion of one satellite in space and some of the shrapnel is heading towards some of the astronauts because mm -hmm. the thing exploded and it's going everywhere. And right. then there's a part in the movie where all the shrapnel arrives and it tears a hole in the spaceship and the space station yeah. has a hole in it now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so how how fast do you guys think that things move? Oh, orbit? they're going fast. When they're orbiting? Yeah. I've seen videos from the International Space Station where yeah. that is also orbiting and it's going like 20, 25,000 miles an hour. Like it's, you, you, they orbit the Earth like eight times in a day, which mm -hmm. is some insane number. I have no idea what, I assume two things colliding at that speed is just instant destruction of both those things mm -hmm. pretty much mm -hmm. instantly yeah 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 so things are in free fall generally around seventeen thousand miles per hour yeah. Jeez. Yeah. there's um something that happened to the iss recently a few years ago where like it was like a, a piece of debris a paint chip something came off of a satellite hit the iss it was so tiny it was like a particle and it left a crater in the ISS like mm. this big. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Like a softball size. Yeah. That's crazy. Sorry to interrupt, by the way. The movie you were thinking of was Gravity. Gravity. Oh. oh. Explorer's been hit. Explorer's Dang. Probably Gravity. Wait, Interstellar. I watched Interstellar. With Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, that had Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, it was. And there was a scene where it destroyed. What? The Maybe satellites. it was Gravity. <laughs> Maybe it was. 
Did it have Sandra Bullock? <laughs> In gravity, yes. that definitely That's happened. gravity. That's, That's gravity? gravity? Okay, that was gravity. gravity. Yeah, okay. Gravity. Yeah, so things are moving at 17,000 miles per hour. Basically, it just causes chain reactions, right? And and so I'm starting to get nervous. He's telling me about this stuff, and I'm like, okay. Um, so you've got SpaceX and Amazon slash Blue Origin and Facebook and Boeing. These are all companies that are confirmed to be putting satellites into space, right? This is just the United States. Um, if SpaceX themselves, Starlink is putting forward 2,000 up, Amazon is supposed to put a few thousand up already. They are confirmed to be doing this. Facebook is st- trying to put up a little mini constellation. Facebook, wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, Boeing, and it's just like, these are just U.S. companies again. Yeah. And they really have not a lot of incentive to talk to each other besides like maybe the fear of Kessler syndrome happening. But there's this estimate by that by like a couple years from now, there's going to be over 100,000 satellites in space, right? Hmm. And yes, orbit is very large and there's a lot of room, but yeah, it's pretty big, but it's not infinite, you know, and it's very, to me, it's very similar to the oceans because uh, people thought the same thing of the oceans is like, they're really big. We can throw lots of crap in there forever and it'll never make a difference. Oops. No, it didn't quite, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And, and so, uh, that's the same with the space. Space is famously big. When you have a hundred thousand satellites, even one creating shrapnel and you no longer have the ability to control that shrapnel and it's going everywhere. You can't really like if the chunks are biz- big enough, you could probably track it. But if they're shrapnel, which like, you know, a little paint chip came off and damaged the ISS, you can't really track that. It's just going to go everywhere. Yeah. And so no longer uh, are we just creating this sort of like radio bubble where we can't hear anything outside of the earth. If you have a hundred thousand satellites creating shrapnel you're going to create this dome of 17,000 mile per hour shrapnel around the earth where you can no longer send anything into space. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that article? This was probably a few months ago where there was a, I think it was a Chinese satellite that had like lost communication or power or something and was going to fall out of orbit, but we didn't know where because it was not being communicated with. And it was, it was sort of a trending topic for a couple days where we were like, it's on the path of, this you can follow the path we just don't know when it's going to land it mm-hmm. could land in the pacific ocean oh but now it's over new mexico oh but now it's over the atlantic ocean and it just keeps going and right. going i feel like uh maybe one of these events he's talking about looks kind of like that where yeah. one thing starts to fall out of orbit and as soon as you can't communicate with it it could hit another thing mm-hmm. and then then that's the chain reaction you're talking yeah. about yeah and it creates almost a uh what is the, there's this uh there's this idea of creating like a sphere around the earth that creates this self-sustaining like a like, biosphere, a biosphere sort of. We could create that, but it's bad. It's all shrapnel, <laughs> you know, yeah, and it's yeah. like, it's like we're Saturn, but except it's a sphere and we it's can't. a moat, but now you can't. Yeah. Leave. Oh, right. Yeah. And so, so like, to be fair, the newer satellites have, um, avoidance systems where they're able to sort of like, if they track something coming towards them, they they can avoid. They can dodge things. Yeah, they can dodge things. Technology is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was this event that happened where the space force, um, now U.S. space force, yeah, noticed that the one of the Starlink satellites was coming within it te- technically like ten times the limit that it allows, which I think was still like. A couple kilometers. It's yeah, still I'm very curious far. how close they actually get. I it was it was a couple kilometers or a few kilometers, and they they were like, "It's probably not going to hit it," but it, this is still ten times over our limit. And so they have propulsion systems in the Starlink satellites that allow them to kind of move. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, <clears throat> it's more of a communication thing, right? Because you get all of these companies, and so I started thinking about what happens when every other country starts getting in the game. Obviously, China's competing with us, Russia's competing with us, India's competing with us, the UK. uh, There's things. this one internet company called OneWeb from the UK that's also teamed up with India that's putting stuff into space. And individual countries have even less incentive to communicate with other countries, right? The only incentive that they really have in this whole satellite space race is it costs them money if their satellites break by hitting other people's satellites, uh, which is crazy. And again, it's like the FCC and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, they're kind of pointing fingers at each other as to like who should be regulating this. And so now the issue on light pollution really is that nobody seems to be 
feeling responsible for it, right? That's Joseph Kohler. He's a space policy strategist at aerospace.org. If you if you uh, look at um, some announcements from like the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, they have clearly stated that they feel that light pollution, you know, from space on the ground is in their job char of responsibilities. However, they also provided since, um, I think, uh, since 1986, uh, for, for many years, they've provided the FCC with a categorical exclusion, right? Basically telling them, telling the FCC, okay, you just go forward and, and provide your spectrum licenses, and we don't have to look at those constellations from a light pollution perspective. It's very weird. It's like, it's just uncharted territory, quite literally. Is it littering? <laughs> if you put up a satellite and it falls down on the earth, did you litter? Do you get charged for littering? Uh, I think so. I think yeah. there was actually a thing that, that happened where they said, like, if your satellite crashes in another country, the country is liable for any damages that happens. Right. I think the one that did end up falling out of orbit disintegrated before it hit anything yeah so a lot of the spacex um starlink satellites are made now to burn up uh in orbit but something else that jonathan mcdowell told us was like okay so these are made to be able to go out of commission you can propulsion them into low enough orbit so they ended up just falling into the atmosphere and disintegrating mm -hmm. but we also don't know what that much heavy metal is going to do with, to our atmosphere, right? Like we're already worried about putting too much carbon in our atmosphere. So that got us really concerned, especially for the the multiple countries just not wanting to communicate with each other. And like I said earlier, uh, the more GDP that your country is pumping out, the better your country is doing. And a lot of countries are just very happy to have the higher GDP, you know? Um, and a lot of these countries are wanting to compete with the US too. And then there's individual companies within those countries and it just kind of creates this exponential thing because it's like yes there's going to be a hundred thousand launching from the u.s in the next couple of years let's not even think about china and russia and india and the uk like you know it's ridiculous doesn't sound like there's a clear good solution no like controlling space is probably the biggest question mark like obviously we we want to everyone wants to be the one that controls space and i feel like i've seen this meme on twitter of like you should buy land on mars because mm -hmm. some somebody will buy it from you later and you just who are you going to buy the land from like who owns that land now i don't know it, yeah there's there's a lot of questions about ownership of that space right i don't know if there's an answer to it right just space like space president Space president. <laughs> it's like just because the U.S. put a flag in the moon doesn't mean we own the moon. Yeah, like why? That, you know? that could be, yeah, it's just the moon. Yeah. 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 That, that just all got me thinking about regulation. Like how do we slow this down? How do we make sure this is done safely? Like it's just going to happen whether or not we want it to, which kind of sucks. And the U.S. can't just say like, okay, we're going to take control of this, but we already let Starlink put 42,000 up. We can't say no to Amazon now. We can't say no to Facebook now when we already said yes. I mean, they could, Can you? but then it's, you know, I don't know. It seems they should just set a, this is my complete amateurism talking. They should, they should just set a hard limit. We will not allow more than X satellites to orbit Earth at once. Right. And I guess that's not a great answer because that just makes it a race for who can what make happens, them all the fastest. Yeah, but like, look, if the U.S. puts a limit and says 100,000, what happens when every other country is like, oh, cool, the U.S. is self-limiting themselves. Oh, yeah, and true. Then they we're going to put a million. Country. We have no limits. We and we're no just going to keep yeah, going. Yeah, because the one that point. creates, that controls most of the network kind of is the winner. We've seen the same thing with 5G, you know, right. with Huawei and Qualcomm and everyone's trying to like control the most broadband. There's a lot of parallels to 5G. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. All these, all these, uh, like it's an infrastructure thing. There's a lot of, of unfounded day. concerns about 5G yeah. as well, uh -huh. but there are still very valid concerns about like, you're going to have to have a tower on every block in right. all of the world. That's just too much new metal. Like there's yeah. just too much stuff to have around. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's it's and it's all it all comes down to wavelengths, right? It's all it all comes yeah. down to basic physics where the faster you can move your wavelength, the closer you have to be to that wave. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean Jonathan was he was convinced that we were eventually going to have Star Wars because uh, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 says you can't put weapons of mass destruction in space or you can't station them in space. So actually if you read the treaty carefully, you can put like high explosive uh, space fighters out there. That's completely consistent with the treaty. 
Um, there's nothing in the treaty that says I can't come up to you in my X-wing fighter and and uh, uh, blow you out of the sky as long as I'm not using weapons of mass destruction to do it. Right. You're not allowed to mount anything on any like body in space, but mm-hmm. you can send like a warhead through space if you wanted to. Hmm. Yeah. So you could shoot it into orbit and then have it land somewhere else. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. So I wanted to like figure out how the heck do we start regulating this? Obviously, a lot of these astronomers have a very kind of negative, very doomsday-esque idea of what will happen. And the general sense that I got from all of them was kind of this just like, yeah. Yeah. We're screwed. Like the hobby. Yeah. Like yeah. This almost happy like depression <laughs> like <laughs> is what I was getting. Um, yeah. So so Jonathan Goodall, it, it was funny. He was like, don't worry. The United States will absolutely use orbit for war. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. Great. Cool, cool, cool. Fun, yeah. Great, great, great. Great. Love it. We should make an, uh, another one of those treaties. Yeah, I brought that up, actually. I said, do you think that there will be a new space treaty that's going to be written up? There's been a lot of discussion about that. This but treaty is 50 years old. And it's really showing its age. It's all written in terms of, you know, the assumption is that all the satellites are either Soviet or American, right? Uh, right? Um, and, and space is a lot more complicated now. And so uh, those assumptions don't hold. Uh, and it's sort of being kind of duct taped to keep working. Uh, um, but yeah, there needs to be a new outer space treaty, I think. And, and the question is, how can we get one? It's not going to be easy. And he said, honestly, I don't think it'll happen anytime soon. Uh, If it does, it's going to be after things have gone bad. And again, there's just kind of this. So I don't want to like, you know, this podcast to be super downer. But (laughs) it seems like treaties usually come after things are headed the wrong direction. (laughs) Which that's what it seems like he's saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody really listens and people are screaming into the void until there's a major problem. Yeah. You know, got to get everybody on the same page. Yeah. Wow. So I kind of I was wondering, like, there's got to be somebody that is that is trying to regulate this or trying to create regulation for this, right? Like this can't just be happening and, and nobody is working on some sort of regulation because if I'm this freaked out right now as an individual (laughs) who has just called a few people on the phone, you know, there's gotta be other people. So I found this website, uh, it says organization called aerospace.org and they're this third party organization that creates kind of policy that they recommend to People like NASA or governments, different governments. Uh, they try to, you know, figure, they do testing to figure out how much of a problem these things in space are going to be. And then they do math on them and say, like, because of this data, we say that this should be the way that things should be. Um, so there are a couple of people that I talked to about, about that. Uh, and mostly I came away with them sort of feeling like, well, there's going to be a monetary incentive for these companies to make these things safer, mostly because of that Kessler syndrome thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and also because people do care to an extent, uh, right. Still worried about the communications issues and all of the like telescope problems that you're going to have when you have all of these satellites going over the top. But a lot of these people were kind of under the assumption that it would regulate itself in a way, which I'm mixed on, I'm quite mixed on personally. Um, they they kind of figured like, because if you create issues like satellites running into each other, there's going to be such a monetary issue where you're blowing up your own money and then you're also going to probably have to pay to clean up whatever happens. The other thing about the financials is that in theory with that much scale, it gets cheaper and cheaper to launch satellites. Like yeah. we're supposed to have right. reusable rockets and we're supposed to be able to do this thing way more efficiently. Kind of sounds like, you know, there's millions of cars on the road and it's in everyone's best interest not to crash. But if a couple <laughs> crash, like, yeah, they're going to crash. It's a numbers right. game after a while. But Kessler yeah. syndrome doesn't happen on Earth, you know. We've got gravity Not the, quite right, right, right. Yeah. But even even to that same, this just the idea of like it's in everyone's best interest not to ever crash into any other satellite. Mm-hmm. But there's going to be so many right, that, that it becomes a mathematically, problem. like it's probably going to happen a couple times. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, with the best of the tech available, mm-hmm. it won't spiral out, out of control yeah. in some event. But yeah. um, 
they're just going to have to deal with the financial repercussions yeah. of a couple of those. And that's something Emily was talking about was like... It is a really, really expensive endeavor. And one could argue very inefficient. <laughs> um, and so because of that, you know, the, the dream for Starlink, I'm sure, and these other companies is they figure out a way to make it cost effective. And over time, you know, the technology develops further and further. It will get cheaper. But right now, it's it's incredibly expensive. It, it still is. And what they're sending up right now is costing them billions. It costs a crap load to launch these satellites right now. Right like now. It's, it's yeah. so expensive. And Starlink's goal is to bring high-speed internet to everyone at a very low cost. Right now, the $500 dish plus $100 per month is not exactly bringing... Not accessible to everyone. Accessible internet to no. people who don't have access currently. Yeah. Um, Jonathan McDowell said an interesting thing. He said... I think it's a false choice. I think a lot of the reason that we don't have sort of fiber and other non-satellite based internet in a lot of places is regulatory and not technical. Because yes, 40% of the world doesn't have internet right now, but then can't we just give them internet the way we've always given everybody internet? Like, hmm. I can kind know? of see how that, like there are places where it's just hard to get the infrastructure there, but then at the same time, can the, like some of those places afford like so, yeah, the satellite I, stuff. So if you, they're charging, like you said, that kind of money for it. Currently, it's I, also, I think it's just a monetary problem. It's like it's not profitable to bring in yeah. to these regions right now. Right. And until it is like the satellites seem like a good thing, but also. But that's also so extremely expensive. Issues. And is that going to be profitable? Yeah. Well, they just think that they can get enough up. They can make it cheap enough to launch these into space and deploy enough of them that mm -hmm. it'll eventually be. And the, the cost has gone down for them significantly even okay. over the period of time they put it up. But I think that's um, everyone that I asked, like, why wasn't this a thing before? Right. Because HughesNet, like we said, was a thing before with the geo, geo um, geocentric orbit, geosynchronous orbit. Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's only a couple companies that were doing it back then, which is weird to me. And like a lot of them have sort of gotten out of style. And most of the people I've talked to were like, it's a it's a cost thing. It just like they realized it was not really profitable. Mm -hmm. But when you have a billionaire spa space race with a few companies that have too much money and they don't know what to do with it, mm -hmm. that's when you start investing in the things that are inaccessible right now for 90% of companies that you can eventually become profitable, right? Mm -hmm. They're the only ones that can do this. And this is the only time in history where you have this much money in the hands of these few companies. So yeah. it just becomes this thing. Another woman that we talked to uh, named Robin, who was uh, also part of that aerospace.org website, she told us there's this registration convention as well. There are a couple things that are already in place that have been there for a really long time. So although the Outer Space Treaty is kind of the, the number one most talked about space treaty, there is actually a couple others that were negotiated in the, in the 60s and 70s. And so one of them is the Registration Convention. And so that, that one has a lot of countries signed on, including the United States. And that means that countries will register their space objects with the United Nations and say, here's you know, some basic features of the satellite, what it's doing, where it's going. Um, you know, whether or not that treaty is fully implemented and whether countries are being super timely on when they send in their data and how much data they send, that's, you know, up for debate. Um, but they also have lots of both governmental and non-governmental organizations that track space objects as well. Countries do need to register satellites with their like trajectory angle direction that everybody is kind of proposing. It's, it hasn't really happened yet. Like a ledger? Yeah, would, like a ledger, and actually like a public ledger, like almost like a public ledger. Yeah, they they wanted to create this themselves, and I think um, Jeremy was working on something like this with somebody else, where they wanted to create sort of like a public ledger situation. I don't know if it would be run on the blockchain. Mm. Seems like it would be a good use of the blockchain, a decentralized yeah log. So yes. nobody, I mean, not that anybody would want to incorrectly input their satellite's direction uh, and velocity and well, whatever. Well, it could be a malicious thing. I, don't I, know. I guess, yeah. And With every system, somebody right. wants to take advantage Some of it. Some evil doctor genius could mess up the ledger and then mm -hmm. create Kessler syndrome and destroy the planet if they wanted to. It's going to be a movie. On the blockchain. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. So, Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> so, what's the Ethereum of satellites? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't answer that. <laughs> um, so, I, I, I wanted to ask, 
Jonathan, like, what's the worst case in the future here? And what's the best case that potentially happens, right? He says, worst case. Nothing happens until something, there's some disaster. And then people go, oh, I suppose we should actually fix this. Uh, And it's too little too late. But that's the way humans do things. Depressing, I know. But but I, I, I just looking at the history of, of all of these issues, it's hard to draw any other conclusion. Uh, and so the best case scenario is you have an international system in which we keep track of and manage space as a resource and make and, and you know, provide the opportunity for companies to do profitable things, but constrained by uh, um, paying for the externalities, right? Paying for the ways in which these satellites affect the environment and constraining how many satellites you can have without, you know, causing problems. And so I think we'll have, we eventually have to evolve towards a system of that kind. And the question is, how long does it take us to get there and how bad does it get in the meantime? Yeah, I feel like I kind of have slight adjustments to both of those. Yeah, I'm not I'm not the expert Go at for all. It. Go for it. But on the the first one, which was nothing happens until a disaster. Yeah, we have this thing now where we like name every disaster as yeah. it rolls through the country, and it's it doesn't really seem to change anything. So maybe it would have to be like a super huge disaster, right? But the second part was. Um, Remind me of the second part again, because I the second part was the best case scenarios where we have an international oh. system where we manage like a block. Yeah, yeah, that's that <laughs> kind of comes back to the self regulating thing again. Yeah, if all these countries or these companies are following the regulation imposed by the countries they're in, yeah, their gut reaction is to get out of that country and do that business somewhere else without the regulation, so right. they can do what they really want to do. Right. I'm not the expert, but that's just what I read into when I hear. You know, so we're gonna set so these the limits. So be- the best case for you has some worst case implications. Yes, it's kind of like the Ireland tax law thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's that? That's like where a lot of uh, a lot companies of, are actually headquartered in Ireland. There's no, like federal income Apple tax, is, right? corporate tax. Yeah, or whatever. Apple gets a lot of flack for this all the time because they don't have to like pay certain types of taxes because they're technically headquartered in Ireland. Oh, is that like Libya or something? It's just a small number of countries that have this particular rule where it's like just like encouraging for oh yes this is great for businesses but also now delaware Delaware. it's like a money shelter for it's like delaware like a lot of companies will do that for delaware too because they technically headquartered in delaware so i really wanted to interrupt to say if you guys mentioned blockchain one more time i'm turning (laughs) this whole thing off (laughs) (laughs) your mics are off now (laughs) this episode of waveform is brought to you by storyblocks so you tell unique stories every day But telling these stories and honoring the things that make them special, that's hard to do when you're pulling from libraries full of homogenous stereotypes, basically. You're better than that. And Storyblocks is too. So Storyblocks is an online, demand-driven library of over a million royalty-free stock assets. Whether you need 4K footage, templates, audio, or images, Storyblocks has you covered with their flexible subscription plans that fit every budget. And yeah, they've got a lot to choose from, but after realizing only 5% of their library represented people of color, Storyblocks launched their initiative called Restock. Uh, It's focused on adding diverse creators to capture the authentic and layered experiences of underrepresented communities. Since launching Restock, over 20% of the library now represents people of color, which is awesome. So you'll find collections that focus on the layered experiences of BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, and other underrepresented communities, Black love, queer joy, and other content can be scarce elsewhere, but not with Storyblocks. So go check out the collections and much more at storyblocks.com slash waveform. That's S-T-O-R-Y-B-L-O-C-K-S dot com slash waveform. So I guess I wanted to sort of end this with like um, a conversation uh, about do we think that this is worth it? Um, How do we think this is going to go down? I asked a few people like, what can people do? I wanted to figure out, like, what can people do to try to positively, you know, make positive change, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because these this is going to happen whether or not we want it to. What can people do to really, like, make this nice? I, mean, I got a lot of different answers. Somebody said, like, go outside and enjoy the stars while you can. <laughs> and I was just Ooh, like, jeez. Yeah, I love that. Gosh. I mean, yes, but also, ouch. Yeah. Like, I don't have an answer, but I do have a way of thinking about it, yeah. which is 
a, a lot of the stuff we do here is like we're looking at products and like the final product. Is it a good or a bad final product? And usually that's where my analysis ends. Yeah. But there are some cases where the background noise that goes into creating the product is so strong that you have to consider that too. One of them that we talked about briefly was 5G. Mm. Like I talk a lot about the final product of millimeter wave 5G of like, eh, it doesn't seem worth it. You can't get your signal everywhere. Like this is a difficult thing uh, to build up quickly and it doesn't seem like it holds signal around a corner. Mm -hmm. Like that's the product analysis. But then the background analysis is like, all the infrastructure, all the like building you have to do and all the regulation and like yeah. having this thing on every street corner. And this kind of falls in the same vein. It's like Starlink, yeah, you, yeah I'd like to have gigabit everywhere. That yeah. sounds like a great right. product mm -hmm. if right. it works. You mentioned you've never seen 10 millisecond ping on a game. What if you could everywhere? Yeah. That yeah. would be amazing. Yeah. It's obviously forest. very difficult, but the background noise to making that happen is like literally like filling the atmosphere with tens of thousands of satellites and yeah. possibly never seeing the stars the right. same way again. That's right. that seems or like, like leaving the orbit of the Earth. I'm still surprised that Yeah, that too. Elon and Starlink is potentially doing something yeah, that don't could you clog go to Mars? up our atmosphere so bad and is also yeah. somebody who wants to colonize Mars so badly. I, I mean ultimately that's <laughs> after something bad happens, but it yeah. sounds like if something bad happens it spirals. And it's also that his thinking could be very like self centric where he's not thinking about the I mean, he's probably thought about all of this, I'm sure. But like just the exponential growth of all the other companies plus all the other countries with a bunch of different companies within them versus just Starlink, right? Because Orbit's big enough that you could send up 42,000 and yes, it would outnumber the amount of visible stars, but we can still at least get stuff into space and all the Starlinks are one system. They're all talking to each other. Mm -hmm. But once you get satellites from other companies are not talking to each other. It's yeah. there's some correlations with our. I mean, road yeah, it's, trip it's naive to think if you do something like that, it's not going. Other people aren't going to want to do that. Exactly. So like, it's exactly. going That's to happen. The nature of capitalism is that there's going to be more, and everyone's going to try to be doing better and more than yeah, each, so than each if, other. Yeah. So if he's it's the one that wants exponential to, growth thing. Yeah, he's the one starting the ball rolling though, and, yeah. and starting that going. So that's why it's kind of weird to me that it's like a right. weird game of space monopoly. Yeah. I like if every it. if every car on the it. road was made by the same car manufacturer, they could all talk to each other and nobody would ever crash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a monopoly. You can't have Are that sort of lack monopoly? of competition. No, I'm just giving the one upside because every <laughs> yeah. company wants to be monopoly. Right? No, no, I, yeah. But yeah, so now you look at like yeah. okay, if every satellite in space was talking to each other, that would be pretty good. Right, but that's kind but of that's impossible not how it works. with the competition like, yeah. that's required. Here's a here's another image um, from 2019 showing a bunch of Starlink satellites flying through this giant image just, yeah there's what there's got to be like 10 to 15 lines just going straight yeah, through that looks like if you gave a four-year-old a crayon in a construction site with, like and you could paint the wall really as much as you want but it'll never look <laughs> as good as you want with that yeah. four-year-old with crayon in there yeah wow so and again this is from two years ago and it's uh, only a fraction of what we're gonna have i i think like going through this episode <laughs> it sounds bad but my outlook on all of this is gotten grimmer and grimmer uh, yeah the minutes have gone yeah. by it's well there was one guy we spoke to dr joseph Kohler, collar i yeah. believe and his outlook was more positive towards regulation being coming from the companies themselves space companies are a different uh, different type of companies in the sense that it's very very capital intensive now that being said i think that gives us some time from a regulatory perspective to, to understand um, what the projections are, what the forecasts are, what the type of satellite or constellations those companies are proposing, to start working with those companies, recognizing that there is a need, uh, recognizing there's a common benefit, uh, but also recognizing there's common risk, and starting to work with those companies and developing the right, the right rules of the world and the right best practices. So he was kind of saying yeah. that because of the monetary incentive that everyone has, and e it's in every company's best interest to not crash into another company, that the regulation is going to come from the bottom up, from the companies into government. How do you guys feel about that? I don't I know think if I buy it. It's very yeah. optimistic. It's <laughs> super, especially early, but it, it eventually becomes a numbers game, and we see every company, I mean, every single company does things that take losses at some point, and mm -hmm. like, that is something that's going to happen, and like, how catastrophic is that? Mm -hmm. to to other things like as long as it's not catastrophic to their business they don't care yeah and i don't know if i 
trust yeah. that I'm trying to draw that like much a, for the rest of civilization. I was trying to draw an analogy of like companies self-limiting themselves in order to not crash into others. But it's just like, I don't really see that in any other industry. <laughs> so yeah. it would be very optimistic I, for this to be the first industry where companies are like, you know what, for the better of the planet, let's not do so much. Yeah. To go into zero regulations and think that rather, like we have companies that are going into regulations and yeah. still like mm -hmm. not self policing themselves no, it's correctly very, with drawn lines. It's, I know it's a very like sad outlook, but it's like if you don't do something, someone else will. If it is profitable and if it, it will get them ahead of other people and yep. that's just the way the world operates and so i think that's why a lot of these astronomers are just they they're just convinced it's like this is happening yeah i mean who could like i can't even think of what out how to get around it potentially yeah and start regulations i know it's like it be, that's the thing is like the u.n space president yeah, the One u.n president for is all of space <laughs> the u.n is the group that had the space treaty but um it wasn't every country that signed on to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of countries have signed on but not ratified, which apparently like signing on is technically the equivalent of ratifying, but you didn't actually sign the doc. You didn't ratify the documents. You didn't have people saying, yeah, we did. I don't oh. know. It's confusing. Um, but that's the thing is like there's no one like president of the planet. And without that, it's going to be really hard. Are to, you like, suggesting regulate. planet president? <laughs> You're onto something. <laughs> Yeah, one that's ruler. what I'm suggesting. Yeah, clearly. one big game monopoly. Yeah, wow. But so, on the flip side, everyone gets free internet. How important <laughs> is that? Yeah, I don't enjoy that what, ten milliseconds. What part ping. in here were we yeah. getting free internet? Was it actually free no, internet? It's not, not free. Not free internet. Internet. Yeah, I was gonna Sorry, say like everyone gets it's internet. Still, that's Low cost. That is also the other thing. There is like, yeah, I guess it has to get cheap enough, but like. Uh, at the time it gets cheap enough to hit those places that are really not able to get internet right now, is there a better solution to get internet to them by then? It just feels like something yeah. that's super, super expensive, which goal is to get something super, super cheap right. to people that can't right. quite afford it. I'm, I mean, obviously. Elon's willing to throw a lot of money at this problem. Right. Yeah. You know, because he will eventually profit a lot from it. Um, also, just a, a couple quick uh, fact checks. Uh, it was... The European Space Agency, which had to take evasive action to stop its satellite from being hit with Starlink, uh, there was a one in a thousand chance it was going to get hit, but that was ten times over their threshold that they were willing to cross. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the average Starlink satellite is 573 pounds and about the size of a table. Mm -hmm. so, oh, that's way smaller than I thought. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know what a table, what table they're talking about. That's the oh, thing. When I was doing this research, 500 I was like, pounds is not very, that's smaller than a oh, car. Oh, pounds, for sure. yeah. 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 Pounds, it's like a sure. motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But, but, you know, there's also 60 in a, in well, a yeah, constellation. Well, yeah, yeah, still. I mean, 60, and we're talking about tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's going to be a lot of traffic up there. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we, we shared that article around recently about SpaceX doing like ads in space with, with satellites i don't right. even want to think about that i don't see how that's possible yeah i, I mean if they have forty two thousand, they might be able to take a few of them and create drink your old teen over the sky but anyway <laughs> that's quite dystopian it's that kind, one it's kind of like the qr codes that's that far they, off, that yeah. in china they put up with drones you know flying qr codes anyway that's pretty off topic uh Basically, I want to just follow the story as it as it happens in the next couple of years because it's going to happen very quickly. And the fact that just a year or two ago we only had about um, six thousand or seven thousand satellites in space, and now there are twelve thousand is just kind of like, well, twelve thousand have ever been launched. There's seven thousand now, and there were only like five thousand a couple of years ago. And it's just kind of like you said that curve, that exponential curve. Mm -hmm. It's just doing that, and I'm. More companies like Amazon and Facebook and, and OneWeb and all these companies have started saying, actually, we're going to put a constellation in space. Actually, we're going to do a constellation. In 2019, Amazon said they were going to put 3,236 in space, and that got delayed. And they're still on track to eventually put them into space. But now that Starlink is doing 42,000, I have feelings that they're um, trying to up that number. <laughs> So, so knowing everything that you guys know now, mm -hmm. I guess the final question would be, is it worth it? Is it worth it to give internet to everybody for a low cost? And potentially lose and some of our lose. astronomy, some yeah. of the night sky. As, a, as someone in the very privileged position of having access to internet everywhere I go, 
I don't need more satellites. But that will not be everyone's position. And you have to think about the, again, I'm mostly in the business of thinking about the final product and how it affects the person. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of people who would love the idea of, wow, I, I live in, you know, where did we just drive? We had no internet for like half of the trip we just did for a thousand miles. But like, yeah. It would be really nice to just have internet all the time up here in Lake Placid in the forest when I go camping or something. And uh, I think a lot of people would probably say it's worth it and that they don't really care about the astronomy or the yeah. meteors not being seen at dawn or <laughs> Getting dusk. Getting hit like, by a giant that's meteor. That's just kind of like, all right, that's the sacrifice they're willing to make. Yeah. Um, but from where I sit, I think I'm good. Yeah. I think that's a good way of putting it. I, I do like if our entire world had high speed internet, I think we'd function just as society much better because there's all these different you <laughs> know, remote, if. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I mean. remote islands yeah. and places that are just like super remote that can't get it. And just right. like if places like that or, or, you know, poorer countries that if they had it, it would benefit them immensely. And if it were just to take away the fact that we can't take pictures in space, um, then I, yeah, then I think it's for the better. But I think if we're doing this ultimate aspect of like potentially stuff falling from the sky out of nowhere or like limiting ourselves and destroying our atmosphere like it gets way tougher to, yeah. to say that. Marquez looks like he had I just a, had a random like light revelation. bulb moment. Oh. Airplane Wi-Fi. Does it get better with Starlight? <laughs> Probably. <sighs> Marquez oh. is like screw the astronomers. Oh, you know, right. I'll take my Put them up. <laughs> You'd probably get better <laughs> Wi-Fi on the airplane than you would on Earth because of that inverse square law. Oh I'm in. You've swayed me. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> You've swayed me. Sorry, Sorry. Mr. McDowell. Uh, oh, man. McDowell. No, that's that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess one one kind of counterpoint is, you know, these areas that the forty percent of the world that doesn't have internet. Like the the like rapid change of life and change of quality of life and like movement from being like third world to second world to first world country that you get from transfer of information like I, yep. like Massive. from my from my like cl IT classes in college just like researching all the different changes in the speed in which we transfer information and how quickly society developed because of these like exponentially faster ways of transferring information like information is everything it went from you know stone tablets to horse and buggy to the post to email was the biggest freaking change in the way that the that business in, in the world operated. Yeah. And then we have... Way the, to ignore you know, the printing press. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Books. Forgot about that part. Yeah. Forgot about the book part, yeah. The wheel. The wheel. But yeah, it's just it's it's just these, these areas could go from being extremely remote to like participating in the global economy. Yeah. And that's 40%. It's a yeah. very big portion. You know, right now, obviously, they can't afford it. But um, eventually, if it gets cheap enough that they can, like, that could really change the way the world works. And I've definitely heard from some people that say, like, you know, can I say screw on a podcast? Uh, <laughs> screw trying to colonize Mars. We should be taking care of yeah. our, the planet we have. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, I think there are, there are multiple sides to that. Obviously, we know that our yeah. planet is eventually going to become uninhabitable. But That's my favorite Neil deGrasse Tyson anecdote. Yeah. When he's like, all right, so I heard that in order to populate Mars, you first need to terraform it. So you drop nukes on the poles <laughs> and you've like, you know, you, re you restructure the whole planet and the atmosphere and everything. And that's going to take billions of dollars and like all these years but we also already have Earth, and that's in pretty good shape. We yeah. could probably do a little bit better and yeah. a little bit cheaper like if we just fix Earth. up the one we have here. Yeah, right. Um, I feel like I'm on that team. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so that's what a lot of people have been saying, too. Yeah. And it's like if we could just really get everyone on the same page and really equalize the playing field for the entire world, like that would be pretty amazing as well. And this is the fastest possible way that that's going to happen, honestly. Like, Because there's not going to be – It's it's like – the rest of the world is speeding up exponentially while no one has even able to get the internet. The long tail, yeah. And we're going to be over here by the time they even get the internet. And it's yeah. just kind of unfair. And this is the way that this could happen really quickly. So it's, you know, there are positives and negatives. Negative, big negative is when you go to Lake Placid to go camping, uh, you're going to be camping under the satellites instead of stars. Yes. So, There'll know. be waterfalls and babbling brooks and it's lots of shooting stars all the time. Shooting satellites. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
So well, uh, that's a future we're possibly looking at. Sorry to bum you guys out today. This is a fun episode. It's funny. Him. I feel like the uh, the boosted episode was it was a story, but it was kind of like a sad ending because the company died. Right. So we're on two two sad endings in a row. <laughs> I don't want to pressure you into a, okay. a happy ending for the next one, okay. but let's let's uh, I'll try to figure. We'll try out to find like a happy story. You know. In the meantime, let us know what you think in the comments because I feel like there's going to be plenty of different opinions and different thoughts about this, and also. Our resident armchair astronomers will be coming out. I'm sure oh, we'll yeah. have lots I of mean, valuable I mean, we were input. resident armchair astronomers today. Yeah, yeah. I put on my astronomer hat a little bit there, but yeah. we'll have them in the <laughs> comment section below, so we'll mm-hmm. check those out too. In any case, this has been Waveform. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, if you're on the video version. And we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Thanks for hanging out with us today, and special thanks to Emily Zhang, Jonathan McDowell, Jeremy Tregalone, reed Robin Dickey, and Joseph Kohler. We couldn't have done this reporting without you guys. Waveform is produced by Adam Molina. We are partnered with the Vox Media Podcast Network, and our intro-outro music is by Vane Sill. Mm-hmm.